you see that both of these topics are too much yet interesting and uh, as per my idea before learning uh, or before starting the first topic by the speaker i want to say some word uh, over the first topic uh, the, our first topic is basically entitled on the business intelligence this particular business intelligence this word uh, is basically defined as to the way out the methodology to make a business intelligent and uh, how can we make a business intelligent through the help of a particular computer application to make a business more convenient more reliable with the help of any computer application we can say that we have made our business as intelligent we can see we can also uh, uh, we can we are surrounded by so many tasks today uh, uh, which are uh, we are known to them very properly um, these are related such kind of matching such kind of embed uh, now number one term is called i can say uh, i want to highlight some of the some of the terms uh, number one is data warehouse what is the data warehouse data warehouse uh, i i first in the title in this the list of the terms means uh, data warehouse there data mining there the cloud computing there etc etc uh, there are also the business process reengineering customer relationship management supply chain management also there are several terms are available there uh so what is the data warehouse there and how it can embed uh, a particular business process with a particular computer application data warehouse uh, is the basically a core component of the business intelligence and act as a central repository or a large amount of database which basically stores the integrated business data from one or more heterogeneous disparate sources like multiple computer sites and aim to input the data access and processing we all at and as we all are surrounded by data warehouse in the modern computer technology uh, in that in that case also we can say we can uh, we are uh, most familiar with another one term which is uh, more related with the data warehouse which is known as data mine which is basically works on three pillars number one is machine learning the artificial intelligence and also it involves a great part in the statistics it is basically a functionality of examining analyzing summarizing the information from the data warehouse where it stored a lot of amount of information to produce more useful information to improve our business process another uh, one uh, the most important thing, uh, another one uh, the term is called cloud computing which is also surrounded by uh, the a complete a business process is surrounded by a computer it can, uh, what is the cloud cloud we can say Uh, a brilliant extension a brilliant extension of the client server the client server architecture a cloud can be assumed also as a virtualized huge resource pool which is available online and uh, they are also have, um, offering us a large amount of computer services also including the server storage databases networking software analytics and intelligence over the internet here basically we term or we abbreviate the internet as the cloud uh one uh, one, one most uh, most uh, famous example uh, are in front of us uh, is that more, all of us uh, today all of us are using the microsoft office uh, and we whenever we have prepared any kind of a document in microsoft office uh, means any kind of a spreadsheet any kind of a powerpoint and any kind of a word document we like to store it in our local machine but uh, is our local machine is safe to store the all of our private documents today in the uh, in in the case uh, that we are surrounded by any kind of a um, hacking uh, or any kind of a data corruption then we must have to store the data in such a place in which it, it, it is it will become more reliable it will make us become more uh, secure right and as per my idea if we will use the cloud version of the ms office then it will offer us a uh, cloud uh, storage which is uh, nothing but the microsoft one drive right? what is this microsoft one drive it is basically a cloud space uh, which we will we can use to store our created documents various kinds of data uh, in this particular cloud storage with a full security and full reliability and uh, now uh, actually it's my uh, time and now i request uh, mr francis our make uh, our next speaker um, to continue a more elaborate study on this particular topic Mr. Francis. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh,
Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you very much for having me on, on this uh, uh, occasion. Um, I, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, sir. Okay. You can see the blue screen, right? Yes. <clears throat> oh, perfect. Okay. So, um, welcome again, and thank you so much uh, for inviting me to this webinar today. Um, the topic that you've chosen is a very interesting topic. Uh, 5G and beyond, uh, and its relationship, uh, as Shubhidi has uh, actually mentioned, its relationship to business intelligence and also market value. Um, so uh, I, I have to thank the organizers for this, you know, for your uh, for putting all of this together. Uh, for me, uh, I intend to uh, to show that the the world is moving uh, if very rapidly into what we know as the fourth, uh, fourth generation uh, industrial revolution. Um, and of course, you know, this, um, uh, this bringing about the 5G interconnectivity uh, would enhance and enable different types of businesses. But not just the businesses, but also for personal decision making. Okay, uh, and because of this, because of this world in which we're moving into over the next five years, my argument is that we are going to be requiring ultra reliable, low latency communication. Okay, um, and I'm going to get um, uh, Saptashi will talk more about the technical aspect of that. But the question we have to ask ourselves, just uh, for everybody's interest, you know, what is 5G. 5G, as we know, uh, is a is a new network designed to connect virtually, virtually, and I mean virtually everyone and everything together, uh, including uh, machines and also um, objects and devices. Okay, so like I said, Subtashi would delve in a little bit more into the 5G evolution. I'm not going to cover that one here, but what I what we are seeing is with 5G wireless uh, technology, uh, we're delivering a higher multi-gigabyte per second type of packages, okay? So ultra low latency becomes a really key factor to 5G. More reliability, massive network capability, increased availability in terms of broad broadband connection and all of that, and a more, uh, what we called a more unified user experience when it comes to uh, sort of surfing online. In terms of the market value, in terms of the position we should be looking at, if you were a prospective business person, um, what we should be looking at is we could describe this as the 5G as an essential, uh, uh, is so essential uh, to the next generation uh, augmented reality AR or virtual reality experience. Okay, so uh, in terms of its market value, we could describe it as higher performance. Okay, so higher performance and improve efficiency. The next thing also is empowering, empowering new user experiences. So, uh, for example, uh, you will see if I can get, if I can sort of highlight on here, you probably will see um, uh, the automa automated video streaming. So in that respect, we're talking about, you know, every user within that space having the consistent experience. So if you imagine if you had a, a 3D imaging, or if you had some kind of a, a high uh, a, a video streaming, everybody, no matter what the device is, will have the same experience. This is some of the things that 5G will enable. So it's empowering new user experience. Um, we have the issue of crowded event sharing. So we're talking about extreme capability so people can begin to participate. Well, when I say participate, I mean virtually participate in gaming, for example, in being in a, in a football, on a football uh, a, a stadium, being in a football stadium and watching a football match and actually interacting. 
okay, using a particular uh, uh, sort of wearable to have a, an enhanced experience. So connecting and creating new industries, if you were looking to start an, an opportunity, just remember what happened with 3G. Before 3G, we never used to have the app stores. OK, but come 3G, we now have businesses that are solely developing apps yeah, and putting them online and actually making humongous amount of money, turning businesses around, having a different type of business outlook. OK, with 5G, this is going to create new opportunities for businesses. Um, and we, we, we just have to know that this is this is really coming. So think about this business opportunities that will be generated. But not just that, think about the unspeakable amount of data that would be generated and the new decision making processes that would emerge. OK, so this is important. So we have, for example, in the in the left uh, bottom corner here, we have things like the six uh, six degree freedom, immersive content. Yeah, where you find uh, a, a sort of a, a someone almost engaging in a real life streaming. You have the remote sort of tactile uh, internet where you might have a surgeon on the on one side of the country actually operating on a, on a on a patient in another in another part of the country this kind of tactile internet this is the kind of re remote uh, sort of um, uh, experience the kind of the remote opportunities that this new technology will afford okay so we're looking at the the need for low latency and this is one of the things which I feel is coming uh, pretty soon. So where is 5G being used? As I said, it's broadly speaking, 5G is being used across three main types of connected services. The number one is the enhanced mobile broadband. In addition to making our smartphones better, what we are seeing is 5G uh, mobile technology will usher in uh, new immersive experience such as the VR, uh, AR, uh, will become faster, more uniform data rate transfer, low latency, and lower cost per bit. Okay, so lower cost per bit. Mission critical communication. Uh, when we talk about mission critical communication, uh, we are talking about services. 5G can enable new services that can transform industry with ultra reliable, low latency, remote control uh, type uh, experience or deliverable. So think about a smart warehouse. Think about the smart warehouse, uh, which Amazon would be using, for example. The kind of uh, the sort of the shrinking down of a massive uh, warehousing down to a space where it is more custom made that is more responsive to users' needs or customer needs. Yeah, highly uh, robotic in terms of uh, its its configuration. V vehicles, medical procedures. These are the places where mission critical communication uh, will be very much embedded. And then we have the massive IoT, Internet of Things. Massive IoT 5G is meant to seamlessly connect a massive number of enabled sensors in virtually everything. So through the ability to scale down data rates, yeah, power consumption and the sort of the mobility, therefore providing extremely lean and low cost connectivity uh, solutions. Okay, so what does this mean? <clears throat> what does this mean? It means for us, it means 5G capability or uh, is capable of facilitating what we call a forward compatibility. What do I mean by forward compatibility? The ability to flexibly support future services that are unknown today. OK, so we're looking at delivering always available secure cloud services or cloud access where you have one wearable connecting to a different type of infrastructure and also collecting data or transferring, exchanging data between various devices. Yeah, so we're moving more into uh, an online, uh, totally switched on uh, sort of ecosystem of uh, devices, okay? So the other question is, how does customers use 5G? 
So with the 5G, one of the things, I mean, there's the increased data consumption, explosive growth in the video uh, um, uh, traffic, always connected cloud computing. The average, taking the first one, the average consumer is expected to go from being able to consume 2.3 gigabytes of data per month, which is what we've got today, to close to 11 gigabytes of data per month on our smartphones in 2020. Okay, so there is a huge difference difference between consuming today uh, 2.3 gigabytes and moving to 11 gigs data by the kind of transferring that's going on in the cloud and within devices this is driving this is driven by explosive growth yeah it's driven by the explosive growth of video tra uh, traffic as mobile uh, is increasingly becoming the source of media and entertainment plus the massive growth of always connected cloud computing Okay, so 5G will expand the mobile ecosystem to new industries. It's going to expand it to new industries, contributing to cutting edge user experience, such as boundless and extreme reality. So you talk about virtual reality, but we're also talking about boundless, extreme reality, seamless Internet of Things capability new enterprise application, local interactivity in terms of content. And I'll come on to that in a, in a minute. And then instant cloud access. Okay. For example, we will have things like virtual reality, and we're taking this to extreme virtual reality to offer unprecedented experience and possibility. So think about it in terms of immersive play, immersive movie, uh, and shows, live concerts, sports, and other events, yeah, uh, interactive games uh, and entertainment. And then we talk about this sort of the uh, offering, sort of a learning, immersive education. So what we're doing today using Google Meet uh, in the next five years, we're expecting that we probably would have uh, a, a system by which we can do virtually. We can all enter the same room we could all have the same kind of enhanced experience with TG, uh, 3D, uh, 3G, uh, 3D uh, uh, design or imaging. And then communication, uh, social interaction, sharing personal moments and all of that will be taken to uh, a completely different level. Then the other thing is how do businesses use and, uh, this 5G? With high data, this is the thing, with high data and superior network reliability, 5G will have a tremendous impact on businesses. The benefits of 5G, uh, it is said, will enhance the efficiency of businesses, while also giving users faster access to information. Um, again, what do I mean by this? We're looking at a, a situation where uh, the sort of the augmented, if you use the augmented reality, for example, we're talking about a spectrum, a broad spectrum of roles in a daily life. Yeah, applicable across age, gender and activity. So you're talking about uh, sort of the immersing uh, sort of augmented reality in children pl playing. Yes, uh, young adults exploring imagine going on holiday you go to the Colosseum and you're able to experience get the data from your maybe google glasses or something where it gives you an enhanced experience of that historical place family communication able to record great great granddad and being able to interact with great great grand granddad because we have the data and we have a means of replicating and demonstrating and showcasing that for interactivity, professional working, and also in terms of fitness. So when it comes to sports and all of that. So business intelligence data must be gathered. And this is the thing. So when we're talking about business intelligence, imagine the kind of business intelligence data that would be gathered over all these communication devices. Also, the processes that the 5G would also leverage. It, is, uh, it has to be a ubiquitous uh, and affordable, easy and secured access. This is what we're looking for. This will require new policies to be put in place, both on a local level, national level, and also on a global level. So 
in terms of its taking out just out of the hands of the individual and then making it uh, into, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the sustainability agenda, the global sustainability agenda 2030, 2050. Okay, and we talk about smart cities. So here we see that what would happen is the connectivity between people and things. Cities today occupy approximately 2% of the total land mass. However, the cities are generating 70% of the uh, economics GDP, over 60% of global uh, energy consumption, 70% of greenhouse gases uh, uh, um, uh, emission, and also 70% of global waste. With smart cities, smart cities could use 5G in a variety of ways to transform the lives of people who live in them. So experts in these areas of artificial intelligence and robotics, extreme uh, uh, sort of extreme um, uh, cutting edge reality and computing, and also gaming, they are pulling together to look for ways to move uh, us into the smart city. Yeah, where we kind of tackle some of these uh, global challenges that we are uh, actually currently facing. So IoT, Internet of Things, for example, cities are very good are collecting data. But acting on that data is still quite a very, very new thing. Edge computing, moving data collection to the edge to help people protect their data for being, uh, from being uh, uh, sort of compromised. Then we have robotics and AI, artificial intelligence, to deliver uh, uh, the delivery of everything in the smart cities. For example, delivering your document all the way to delivering your pizza. Yeah, anything you order would be delivered by uh, some kind of a, a robot or some a drone or some other means of delivering that. Gaming and also extreme reality, cities are finding it challenging to get citizens yeah, to get citizens to opt into many of the mobile smart city initiatives. Okay, so what they're now trying to do is uh, is to get you know because people are concerned about being tracked and all of these kind of things, and therefore in order to get people to get citizens on board, uh, this is where developers are using gamification and extreme immersive reality skills to gain people's trust, so that we can all buy into that. Okay, so we're now talking in terms of Qualcomm's uh, research. They found that in terms of in terms of driving global GDP, five G would transform the automotive industry for sure. It would also have a massive impact on healthcare sector. That's for certain. Okay, what we are looking about in terms of the five G economy, it is noted that five G uh, uh, full economic impact the full economic impact is likely to be realized in 2035 we're talking about uh, we're talking about 13.2 trillion dollars of global economic output we're talking about 22.3 million new kind of job creation we're talking about 2.1 trillion dollars of gdp growth here okay but what does all of this mean? It means, therefore, that the industrial revolution we're experiencing or moving into in the, over the next five years is industrial manufacturers are already leveraging. Yes, they're already leveraging some of these different technologies for different types of initiatives. We're seeing this sort of the Internet of Things pulling together all of these new processes and these new products, if you like, into this space where 5G can actually take it to another level. But the question here is how to make intelligent business decision. So if you have all this, um, this uh, sort of uh, uh, main technological uh, processes for improving processes, and you have all of this internet of the 3D printing, advanced materials and all of this for new products, how do you layer all of this on top of the data collection and how, as a decision maker, trying to break into the market, how do you make your decision? A very complex society, a very complex situation in a very comprehensive uh, 5G delivery. 
So different types of uh, uh, technology, um, and we are looking at the use case. So for example, if we say, for example, that India should, was positioned, if India is positioned to supply face marks to the rest of the world, think about the global scale of that. How do you respond? How does India respond to this imminent hotspots where you have, say, for example, the coronavirus thing and where they need this kind of PPE, uh, personal protection equipment? How do, you, how do you facilitate that with that kind of logistical issues? All of these processes and products are going to be engineered much faster, much seamlessly with low latency with the development of 5, 5G. So we're going to be seeing new processes and uh, of course, new products. So the question is, when we talk about business intelligence, we also need to be referring to smart decision making. Okay, and by this I refer to the, uh, the, the sort of the art of providing relevant and reliable information at the right time for the right purpose. Tiffany Boda, uh, Bova, uh, the author of the book called Growth IQ, um, she says, today's winner, today's winners are much more smarter sellers. Why? Because they leverage the advancement of artificial intelligence, machine learning. I think it's been mentioned earlier on. Customer relationship management is taken to uh, a, a new dimension. Market automation, sales enablement and digital capability. And this is how uh, some of the questions, the questions we need to ask is how are each of these technologies improving our market value? How is it improving our decision-making process? How must sales adjust to add value to today's buying journey? Now, remember that it's not just the end product, it's the actual journey. We need to understand the journey. We need to understand the selling conversations, conversations happening in different places amongst different uh, potential uh, um, as, uh, buyers. How does marketing support the transition from this 4G uh, fourth generation connectivity to 5G connectivity? Okay, so ex for example, I'm sure you all remember this, uh, back in the day, when our electro, uh, electronic devices simply told us when um, our battery is about to run out. And it would give you something, I'm sure some of you have those old mobile phones that just told you what the voltage was. But the question to ask is, this kind of 1.5 volts, 1.6 volts when fully charged, this kind of information, how useful is it for you to make a decision? However, if I presented the same information, if I presented the same information in this way, in a smarter way where you can draw inference, okay? So we've taken the same data. Now we're saying at 45% of your battery life, you are still able to have 12 hours left of interactivity on, on your device. It becomes smarter. It enables the user to be able to make decision. Am I going to listen to music for eight hours or am I going to use uh, watch a movie for five hours or am I actually going to put it on saver because I'm traveling, I need to use it for my navigation. Okay, so these are the kind of capabilities we're going to see much more improved. This visualization of data has to be designed so that it is useful to the end user for decision making. The reality of it is that we're living in a very, very complex world. Okay, we're living in a complex world where uh, the growth IQ uh, kind of presents to us some of the difficulties of a manager making decision to move a new brand into a new space. He has to deal with the customer experience, inspire an additional purchasing or advocacy. The customer base penetration, how do you get around that? What kind of data, how, what kind of real-time data would you re require to be able to make those decisions in order to create a market value for yourself as a seller or as a potential uh, startup in this economy? This is some of the things that this 5G is going to enable us. I'm not going to dwell much on this, you know, suffice to say that it's all these complexities that is driving the need for low latency. 
We need real time. We need more stronger, uh, lower energy consumption, consuming devices that can give us real time experience and information. So what do I say? Overall, the business intelligence market is expected to grow from um, uh, a 17.9 billion as it was predicted in 2016 to uh, something like 26.88 billion by the end of next year okay so we're seeing we're seeing a growth here um, um, of about 9.9.5 uh, percent my argument is this is that 5g and its multiplying effect on the sort of the smart business intelligence capability, plus the growth IQ, people becoming more aware of managing data, uh, um, uh, visualizing data, interpreting data in real time would equate the market value. What do I mean by this? So some of the research provided by Market and Market uh, published uh, uh, in 2017, which is very much still relevant, presents us with this. Some of the key drivers here, the restraints, opportunities, and also the challenges. In terms of the drivers, you can see already that increased adoption of cloud has become a key factor. Growth advancing analytics, adoption of data-driven decision-making, which is very important, yeah, for pharmaceuticals and so on and so forth. For blockchain, uh, for all of these financial institutions, this is very important. Emerging, uh, the, the emergence of, of IoT-enabled technology. In terms of the restraints, it's the, uh, the varying structure of regulations and policy. And I did mention that policy have to, would have to change at a local level, national level international level at a global scale we're going to see transformation of policies in order to accommodate this new world in which we are uh, fast entering high investment costs opportunities will be positive return on investment embedded business and so on and so forth we'll see the higher adoption of smes small to large medium enterprises will spring up. Satility of being able to go from one YouTube owner, yeah, who created a potential um, uh, or YouTube channel to somebody who's commanding millions of dollars in few months. Those opportunities are there because you will be exploring real time data, experiencing, engaging in a totally new, in a totally new world. Obviously the challenge Changes would be lack of uh, uh, lack of work skill, uh, management issues, complexities within the sort of a hierarchical structure, flat uh, sort of organizations and all of that transition within the policy uh, structure. Those are some of the issues that we're going to be facing. And I'm just going to finish off quickly um, by industry in terms of the industries that we we'll see here will be banking, finance, insurance telecommunications it uh, retail and cons uh, consumer uh, goods healthcare manufacturing government and defense military um, energy definitely media and entertainment transportation and logistics and of course uh, education okay so this is already happening and this is what some of the people are, uh, this is what the um, uh, um, uh, this is what the director uh, project management of google cloud is saying as companies move to Google Cloud, we're seeing leaders rethink their entire data analytics strategy and how the cloud can impact their business and the bottom line. So this is a real, uh, a real factor. Okay, so this means that the move from one environment to an to a, a, an environment where it's all data resides in a highly structured premises. Yeah, a highly a structured premises in other words it's 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 in a in the cloud which is more flexible to deliver more flexible solutions um, and then just to run ever so quickly finally is that we now see the issue here which we are dealing with which um uh, Saptashi will now uh, go on to talk about will be how do we deal with the issue of 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 latency network latency the challenge is that we're looking for near perfect real life or real time experience uh, for decision making and so on and so forth and Saptashi will therefore go into uh, what it means in terms of the extreme brother them uh, ultra reliable low latency communication massive um, mission type uh, communication uh, and where the 
5G over the next five years will come into it in terms of the routing, self-organizing uh, organizing networks, self-optimization, configuration, healing, self-healing, self-learning. These are some of the things that we're going to be seeing. So the focus of Septari will focus on the blue bit here where you see those nodes connecting and I am um, without further ado going to uh, pass over you know um, uh, to to Septashi to talk about how can we therefore gather data from all these various kind of uh, technological uh, mobile devices and experiences and how can we translate that you know uh, into something that gives us a virtual reality and augmented reality experience which is fits with the next five years obviously the thing I'm talking about here is is in terms of the enhanced mobile broadband, um, the massive um, uh, machine type communication and ultra reliable uh, sort of uh, uh, communication. In terms of the market value and all of these things, what we are looking for is a speed, definitely, but ultimately what it creates is customization, personalization and power efficiency for one and all at a humongous scale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cholche na tik tak. Yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, you have explained it very lucid sweet way, sir, because I am not a, a student of computer science. I don't have any computer background, but we have understood everything, sir. So thank you very much. You have explained so difficult thing in a very easy manner. I mean, the, it's very thank simple you. language. So we can understand each and every word <laughs> because I, okay. we basically, we, I, I am not a student of computer, but I, I easily can understand your words. So thank you very Perfect. much. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. Good to hear that from you. Yes, I can hear you. Um, I think I have shared my um, camera, if I'm visible there. OK, so first of all, I feel really delighted and honored to be a part of this, um, I would say, novel initiative. And thanks for inviting me. I wouldn't take much time on this, but I'll quickly move on to the presentation. Mm. Is my screen shared? OK. So hello, everybody. My name is Shabdarshi Ghosh. I am currently working as a final year PhD scholar in London Salmak University. I'm working under a project called Sonnet, which is a European Union uh, Horizon 2020 project on 5G. And the project is basically focused on the 5G self-organized network a special class of network. I want to see in a moment what is it. If, if you want to connect with me, you can also uh, uh, see me on LinkedIn, ResearchGate, and GitHub. Links are given here. So what is about the networking of tomorrow? So to understand that, I would first start with the genesis, where it all started from. In the beginning, we had signals 
and packets as you all know that the packet carries the data and the signal that converts them into physical reality and carries them over the network right now when things got really complicated we put one more thing called protocols and protocol was something that governs the rules right and then the demands increases types differs and we had different types of networks so this is kind of a basic introduction to any sort of networking classes in undergraduate level i guess so francis did a very good job he set the stage for us he let us know what is 5g what are the expectations from 5g what is the basic you know uh, uh, properties that we're looking for in 5g now what i'm going to do i'll do a bit more technical um, aspect on this so i will take it a bit more um, granular i would say and i will put some more specific information about 5g uh, especially to a problem called routing that's my specialization and this is a very um, i would say a novel uh, problem that we are facing now that let's say now you are seeing me over the internet and i'm streaming my video is a 1080p screen being shared see frame per second now each frame contains like 1920 over 1080 pixels each pixel 32 bits a lot of data right and now it's not just one guy listening to it there's a whole bunch of people and this is what called multicast a lot of traffic is going on and we don't want to have delay in the communication right we want to have a 4k video streaming while you're moving in a train but in the back end what happens the network has to deliver that amount of huge bandwidth to your phone while you're moving and that's a huge game which is the x.25 standard 30 years secure and we need to sort of hide the data since standard vpn standard they came in technologies that affected those standards are frame relay atm mpls right now after 15 years something else happened a group of researchers in stanford they were seeing the problem in a different way they're seeing that the algorithms that run inside the network is sort of distributed in nature and the problem is when they share information with other devices it takes long time for the, the synchronization and during that time the data is waiting on the queue on the device so we are wasting time right what if we have a bird's eye view what if somebody sees the entire network from a different place and this guy can control it and this very idea gave birth of the concept of software defined networks 15 years after the vpn concept came in sdn was formed now i will tell you in the in the run that why sdn didn't actually shine in the industry it was very good um, i would say uh, an approach an initiative researchers actually took this very seriously i took it 3 years back but the industry had some problem with this and they move on to an application of sdn and something else formed called sd wan so state of the art if you say now if you go to the industries you will see like 80 percent of the cases were still in 2000 era we're still using mpls but if you see the network as a training point of view the, the, the recent network engineers have been trained with sd wan characteristics so we are now being trained with what is going to happen in the next five years because when you are a researcher you deal with future right what you are doing today is going to be standardized in the next five years so that is sort of the timeline of what we call the backhaul network so that actually creates the network for the service providers right now what happens in the frontal frontal means the network of the wireless right through which your mobile phone is connected to the network so 1g or the first generation of cellular connectivity came in 1990s um, 10 years after gsm was there was 2g HSDPA or you know uh, CDMA came in as 3G in 2010 and 4G 2015. Now if you see a basic pattern here, the evolution life cycle is becoming shorter and shorter. What took 100 years initially took 30 years after the next iteration, 15 years next, five years after that. So we're exponentially shorting up the number, the amount of time we need to create a new generation. Same thing happened for wireless also. And these two timeline was sort of running you know, side by side, like both are networking based. One more timeline that started in 1960 is on the machine learning. Now, initially, no one thought that machine learning can be like a leverage to 
networking, but I'll show you in a moment how is it. 1960, the first perceptron was built. It's a physical implementation of biological neuron as a circuit. 1990s, DNN, the deep neural network was formed by Hinton. And he solved a problem that was faced in 1970s, why we call that is the winter time of uh, machine learning, a problem called Zor problem was found and people thought that machine learning is failing on solving that problem. So DNN solved that problem, namely an algorithm called a ground breaking algorithm called the back propagation. We still had a problem that time that uh, we didn't have enough resources to compute those problems. Right, we can't. We had the solutions, we had the algorithms, but we didn't have the hardware to run those algorithms until 2005 when somebody saw that okay, we are having graphics computing, gra graphics processing unit, right? The GPU, the graphics cards, and they are processing graphics, which is simply matrix computation. And it is also seen that these neural networks are basically manipulating matrix when they're solving some problem. So, why don't we use it by the graphics cards? And that very idea gave birth of this concept of GP, GPU computing. Means general purpose graphics processing unit based computing. And that changed the whole world. And people have started investing a lot of, lot of money on building new type of GPU that are capable of solving machine learning jobs. And that last hurdle was solved by the programming uh, domains and programming language like Python, R. They came about and they created libraries for easily creating those uh, deep learning networks. And then we are in the verge of 2020. We have software defined network on the backhaul side. 5G new radio standard is waiting in the, in the frontal side and the deep learning libraries are there for the programmers. Now what? Now this thing are going to converge to the next two to five years and what we refer to as 5G and beyond. Now, how these things are getting together? Let me take, discuss here. So this triangle you have seen in Francis's uh, presentation, those three major features of 5G, namely the enhanced mobile broadband, massive IoT or um, massive machine time communications, also ultra reliable low latency communication. Now these three are the basic building blocks, I would say the three basic pillars of 5G. So when they started the discussions of 5G, they said these are the goals, right? We are gonna get these three goals. Now, Broadband is very simple. We are going to get more bandwidths. Fine. What about massive IoT? Now, IoT is a well-known term by now, but I would say a lot of people misconsider IoT as an extension to uh, like uh, machines are communicating with machines, right? It's not like that. It's not like you're having a like a wearable uh, device like a smartwatch and that is monitoring your heartbeat. It's not just this. IoT is an extension to what we known to as the wireless sensor networks. It was there for a long time. People have been searching this. There are many variants of it, like Manet, like Moban. Uh, they are there for a long time. But what IoT did, it just added an extra feature. They use internet for the communication. So now machines are not just communicating stored on the cloud, and the cloud is learning how, for example, what is the average heart rate of a given region of the world. Now that's the information. Let's say in India, if your average heartbeat is something deviating from the standard, this app or this uh, cloud system can inform him that something's gone wrong, right? So this kind of thing that we are getting in IoT just by connecting the entire system to the internet. However, the last feature, which was the latency, unfortunately couldn't achieve it. So companies are now making for 5G, but this part was not achieved. And that's fun time we achieved partially, so the rest is kept for the future. Now, what is low latency? What is URLC? Now, think of an example. The technical term that we use called the tactile internet. Think of a, a surgeon is making a surgery in the US. He is wearing a wearable like um, a VR headset, and he's holding two scalpels. The scalpels are basically having some haptic feedbacks. So there's small um, you know, actuators that vibrates, and it gives a, a feeling that it's sort of touching something. Now, what he's doing is basically working in the air. He's not having any body. He's not operating on a physical entity. That is happening somewhere in a different part of the world, maybe. 
maybe in UK, right? A robot is doing the operation, and this guy is instructing the robot from like like five thousand miles away. Now you see the the critical nature of this problem. Surgery is a very critical operation. If you, for example, uh, put a pressure virtually, that amount of pressure must be conveyed, you know, in real time in this like thousands of uh, of miles away to a robot. Now, what if there's a delay? Let's say you put the pressure and the pressure was not applied at that time. You didn't get the feedback. So you again applied the pressure. Now, when the delay is gone, the robot will apply the same pressure twice. And you know what, gonna, what catastrophe is going to happen after this. So we can't afford this, right? So we need a network that has zero latency, almost zero latency, and that can guarantee us a near real-time communication. Now, this is where the problem of routing will solve it. So self-organized network was developed to kind of counter this problem that okay we have a, a problem now we need a different types of network that would solve it now self-organized network was initially thought of a network that understands itself in the past we used to have two types of people in the network industry one who works in the communication side and they work on the you know the radio tuning and all this the other people used to work on the configuration side so the network guys all right so they are responsible for um, configuring routers and switches and firewalls those things now when the network scales up like you have like thousands and thousands of routers it's not possible for a single human to go and configure it they're basically doing a clerical job you just you just know one thing and you do the same thing again and again and again now how can we optimize it how can we use these human brains for some more fruitful work and let this easy tasks or con configuration to be done by machines. This was the initial idea. Now, self-organized network came up with four major um, kind of aspects. The first one is called self-optimization. So you see the problem as an optimization problem. I want to optimize something. Let's say I want to minimize the delay and to maximize the bandwidth. That's my objective. Anyone who has done any basic course in maths uh, in colleges must know there's a two major things we know in optimization. One is objective function, what we want to optimize and some list of constraints through which you know bound that optimization once we perform the optimization we get some results right the values of the optimal values of the free variables that we want to optimize in case of network there are six namely the bandwidth the delay the load reliability mtu and the hop count okay so these are the six parameters through which a network is optimized the system is optimizing it. Now what? You have to tell the devices, right? Optimize yourself, tune those parameters in such a way that this optimal value can be achieved. This is where the self-configuration comes in. So what we do, we don't need a human to go and type those commands on those devices. Rather, the machine will throw those commands on the machine, on the other machines. And you see, this is where the machine-to-machine -machine communication comes into play, All right? So now humans are not interacting with machines. Machines are communicating with machines. Once we do this, then a different problem comes in. What, what if a system fails during runtime? We need redundancy. Okay, we need somebody. If the main system fails, the other one will take the, the control immediately. Okay, so we don't, don't face any lag. Just think of your Wi Fi connections. If you have like multiple Wi Fi in, in your home, just turn off one Wi Fi. You see, in a couple of seconds, the other Wi Fi turns up. Yeah, that's the self healing property. Now, this three was initially given in 5G. In 6G, although it's now in a research point of view, it's a new term. We don't call it 6G, we call it 5G and beyond because you don't know if it's 5.5 or 6. Um, 6G or 5.5G is going to get, get a new feature called self-learning. So here you are converging with the machine learning or deep learning features with the existing network. So quickly, if we say self-optimization, in my case, it's going to be a routing algorithm. Self-configuration is to configure those routers, so with automations. Self-healing is redundancy. If one router fails, other router will take over. And self-learning will use a specific type of machine learning, although it's beyond the scope of this 
discussion the different type of machine learning algorithms but there is a class which is called deep reinforcement learning which is going to be used in the future days routing algorithms so what is this software defined network so i talked about software defined network i said that changed the world now how did it change so initially we had a scenario like this like routers are there they, they route the traffic so you call somebody the call first goes to a nearest exchange and it asks okay i want to reach to this destination which path should i take and the router is responsible for finding the shortest path for you now these routers had three major operations namely called the planes of operations the bottommost one is called a data plane which is responsible for forwarding your traffic packet comes you see the packet you follow the uh, the packet now how do you forward where do you forward these decisions are made by the control plane and how this control plane will work that will be defined by a human by the management plane so you put the policy saying how to compute with the management plane control plane actually computes it and tells the data plane how to use it that was the scenario for the traditional network okay network that was there before um, you know this sdn era the problem with this the type of uh, you know problem these routers actually perform called the routing mathematically speaking that's a distributed computing problem so each router doesn't know about the entire topology it has to communicate with this neighbor to understand what's happening other you know in other routers and to synchronize with other router that's a necessary part if you don't synchronize you may end up having an unstable state now doing this synchronization wastes a lot of time okay so if they say like 10 hops away a router failed that information must come to you by all those 10 routers right one by one that will take a long long time so can't we say if we put somebody in the top, he sees the entire network and he oversees the entire process. And this is where we took the control and the management plane out of the routers and we put someone in the central server. That was the idea. That was the idea that changed everything. And this was the idea of software defined networks. Now, do you think that's a very novel idea? I would say no. This concept was there like 20 years back when SDN was introduced. But the problem was the amount of bandwidth which is required to communicate between this control and data plane, you see, it wasn't there. So the amount of communication happens between this control and data plane was immense. And we didn't have that much, uh, I would say, infrastructure at that time to accommodate this much bandwidth. So that time it was a plan, it couldn't be succeeded. Now we have a sufficient infrastructure to do this. A quick introduction to what happened here. Once you break it down, what we call the decoupling of the control and data plane, what happens? We impose some laws. Now, for a layman, think of the problem in this way that your data plane is a dumb guy. Okay. He has no brain. He just worked like a clerk. Okay. He has no uh, authority to do any decision making. Now, he has been saved some um, you know some policies and the policies are this that don't use your brain if a problem comes to you ask me now I'm me means the controller here the controller is saying the data plane don't use your brain if a problem comes to you ask me wait until I reply if I can't answer your question okay drop that question if I answer your question keep that answer if the next time the same question ask don't ask me you see, this is the basic laws. I mean, in a layman term, this is what software defined network is. So a packet comes to the data plane. The data plane doesn't know how to deal with this packet. It asks the control plane that, okay, I want to compute this packet, right? Where should I send it to? Control plane uses a problem called routing protocol. And it tells you, okay, use this interface to send the traffic. Next time the same packet comes in, now the data plane knows the answer. It will not ask. And how does this control plane will take the decision? This is done by the management plane. And where we use two terms, the northbound interface through which the management plane and the control plane interacts, and the southbound interface through which the control plane and the data plane interacts. Okay. That is what software defined network is. Now, the raw SDN, you can also find their information in details if you go to uh, the Open Networking Foundation or ONF who are the standardizing body of 
uh, software defined network. And it's an interesting story behind it. Uh, as I mentioned in Stanford, a guy called Martin Casado, he actually started this, this, this research with his team. He ended up being a company called Nicera, and they invented a protocol called OpenFlow. And OpenFlow was the protocol that was uh, the southbound protocol, so between the control and the infrastructure data plane. Now, this became competitive to one of the giant in IT industry called VMware. When VMware saw that these are the competing, so what they did, they bought the company. And they relaunched it with something called the VMware Overlay SDN, or what we now know as the VMware NSX. How does the Overlay SDN is differing? Remember I mentioned that the industry didn't accept the raw SDN. There was something changed afterwards. So what was the problem? Think of that you are running a company, let's say Reliance in, in case of India in perspective, and you started with 4G. You didn't have any 3G, 2G infrastructure. Now, why did the other companies couldn't compete with Geo? The reason was they had invested millions and millions of, of, of dollars buying the hardwares to accommodate those 3G and 4, 3G and 2G bands. Now, when 4G came into the market, they had to maintain all those previous hardware to accommodate the other users who are in the 2G and 3G zone. Also, they want to invest a lot of money extra to buy those 4G equipments. Now, this problem is called the CapEx and OpEx trade-off. CapEx means the amount of money you're spending on the capital expenditure, the buying equipments. And OpEx is how much you're spending on operating them. Now, what happened before 5G, every single standard like 3G, 4G had different uh, way of processing signals. Okay, one of the like uh, determinant factor was the multiplexing techniques. Like in 1G, we have the FDMA. Then uh, 2G had TDMA, 3G had CDMA, 4G had OFDMA. The different multiplexing standard was there. Now, when you buy a 4G, uh, what we call the, the card, the 4G card doesn't support 3G uh, technology. So you're buying equipments. What 5G tells you that, fine, you don't need to buy new hardware. Use it like, an, like a normal mobile phone or a, a computer where the software will come externally. So in case of SDN, what happened? You have to buy like SDN specific switches or routers. Overlay SDN says, don't worry, your servers will be there, your, your infra will be there, don't touch them. Add an extra piece of hardware on top of it. This guy will convert your existing infrastructure with SDN. Now that was huge because you're not spending money on scrapping those devices, but just buying an extra piece of information or the extra piece of hardware that will extend the feature. This is what we call the overlay SDN. And that gave birth of a new technology called the spine leaf technology. The spine where your controller lies, the leaf where your data plane lies. Okay. Now also another story of Cisco. Um, another giant in network industry. So when these things were going on, Cisco also announced their product called Cisco iWAN, Intelligent WAN. And same story, another company uh, showed up called Viptela and they came up with their own product called Viptela SD-WAN. They used the software defined network in a WAN perspective and they started competing with Cisco. And guess what happened? Cisco bought Viptela, right? So now they relaunched Cisco SD-WAN. Now, how does SD-WAN is different? What SD-WAN does, the brain of the router is the routing, right? How it routes. The brain of a switch is switching, how it switches. They took the brain out of it and they put in a server. And the server does all the routing and switching job. Your devices will simply carry out those information. So what you can see in this, in this diagram that all these um, managers and orchestrators, I mean, they are responsible for your um, you know, controlling part. They are in a cloud. And once you put your infrastructure in cloud, it becomes location independent. Think of a document in OneDrive. When you put a MS Word file in OneDrive, doesn't matter where you created this, in a laptop or your phone, you can access anywhere you want, okay? A massively available, infrastructure in the cloud that controls a network. With that, I think I set up the stage to get into the main problem. So this is what is there till now. 
right? But you're not here to see what is now. You want to see what's going to happen in the next five years. So this is a typical software-defined networks, the management plane, control plane, data plane on this. One thing was missing. Remember the, the 5G SON, the self-organized network, the fourth feature of it, the self-learning feature? When we add that, this becomes a knowledge-defined network. So what happens? The SDN is preserved. We have the control plane, data plane, management plane, everything is there. We have an extra plane called knowledge plane. Now, while doing the research, I found an interesting fact that actually this term was coined back in 2001. There's a guy, I mean, when SDN was not even in the place, there's a paper in uh, IEEE um, commission later, if I'm not wrong. He was just hypothesizing that, okay, in the future, there will be a network will be running by AI and machine learning algorithms. And he actually coined this term KDN or knowledge defined network. Now, how does we see this problem from machine learning point of view? Now here I'm gonna be technical. So machine learning uh, problem can be classified in mainly three broad sections, the supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement, okay? Now leave the supervised and unsupervised for this moment. A reinforcement learning algorithm is something that it learns by, by experience. Think of when you learn how to ride a bicycle. The first day you ride on the bicycle, you fail, right? And then you realize, okay, I did that mistake, that's why I fell. Now, next time you try to ignore that mistake, right? Avoid that mistake. And by doing this, you get rewards or penalties as if you are getting feedbacks. And using that, your reflex art gets tuned and you learn how to um, bicycle. The same way, the future networks will behave. The knowledge plane will be, behave like something we call the agent. And the rest of the network will behave like something called the environment. The agent will perceive information from the environment, take decision based on it, and take some action based on it. Now that action is gonna change the environment and the change can be a positive or a negative. If the change is positive, that's a good, right? So you get a reward. If the change is negative, you get a penalty. With the penalty, you learn, okay, the way I decided it was wrong, so I have to rethink. And using that over the time, what will happen, this knowledge plane will understand how the network behaves. One example of that is routing. So see this topology is a, I mean, a classic way of representing routing problem. You have a graph. Um, basically, any routing problem, uh, the mathematical model behind this graph theory, okay? So any routing paper you see, in, in any journal, the first line they start from let G be a graph with V vertex and E edges because that's the basic model for any network topology. Think of this network, the C1, C2 are what we routers here and the controller is, is sort of overseeing those routers. I'm just showing one of the controller's uh, point of view just to make it simple. And each controller knows about his neighbors only. Yeah, if I get into a bit technical, this is something called distance vector routing. Okay, you only know about your neighbors. Okay, don't know about the entire topology. Now, the problem here is that initially these devices were sort of vendor specific, like Cisco and Juniper, HP. They used to build those devices and they used to put standard amount of memory and CPU. So we don't, didn't have huge amount of deviation in the processing power. With the verge of cloud computing, what happened? this thing has broken now you can create a virtual machine and make that virtual machine as a router you can do it now this is the part where i try to emphasize on the importance of software defined networks like when i started my research i didn't get the point why should we study this and then i realized that cloud computing we all familiar with right the infrastructure of cloud when we make it the network of cloud is software defined okay so a quick example, OpenStack is, I would say that the most uh, popular cloud computing platform in the world. The network controller of OpenStack is called Neutron. That is not the network, that's the network controller. So that guy orchestrates the network, okay? So you create virtual routers there and the network type is software defined because the Neutron is now behaving like the controller. Now what happens? Let's say your device is busy, your router is busy. Now, 
basic computer science theory says if the system is busy, the queue increases, the queue length increases, and when the packet comes in, it has to wait a long time to get processed, right? Now, when it takes a long time to get processed, it increases the latency. That is the main problem trying to solve, right? Ultra reliable, low latency. Now, how are you solving this? The problem with the existing routing protocol that they can't detect this, this delay because all the routing protocol be, I mean, works on the what you call the edge cost, means the communication cost, not the cost which are paid inside the node, inside the controller. Okay. So from that, I'm just uh, borrowing a paper of mine I published like uh, two years back. The link is given here. So I know it's a bit technical. So if you didn't get this slide, that's fine. I will try to explain it as simple as possible. So what is happening here that this uh, vertices, you see V1, V2, V3, they are routers. And each router maintains a queue where your packets are being processed, right? Also, there's a queue in the link. So when V1 and V2 is connected, there is also a queue. Now, this exploits a fact, what is called the stochastic calculus, uh, which is used in, as a mathematical model for this kind of problems in networking, that sees the entire network as a series of queues. So when you send the traffic from point A to point B, what you actually do, you put the traffic into a queue, gets processed, take the traffic out of the queue, put it to a different and queue so eventually your entire time span that you're spending on the trap on the on the path is basically the sum of the times spending in the queue now we knew this fact the problem was this that this node cost you see they cannot be modeled in standard shortest path problems in graph theory because the first prerequisite to run a shortest path algorithm is your graph has to be simple means no parallel edge no self loop so you can't put the self loop like this so what i did that was kind of that was a paper actually i put a technique called stochastic temporal edge normalization or ten it normalizes the the node cost into the edges now how did i do this you need to read the papers it's a huge uh, paper so a lot of maths going on there so think of you are um, going to your um, relative's house, you're using a car for that. And you say that, okay, my average time, my average speed of the car is X and the distance is D. So the amount of time I'll be spending, it is what, like D over X? But is it so? You're spending some time on the traffic signals, right? You're spending some time on the, on the traffic also. So these are the time has to be added, right? So how do you solve it? What if you virtually stretch the route by adding those time, then your network becomes this. Okay, so what time you are spending inside the node, you are virtually taking the time and adding as if you are tra traveling somewhere in the road. So you're stretching the road virtually. That was what I did. And this is the algorithm. I'll show you a demo after this, how it looks like. Now, Again, this is also a very uh, mathematical way of seeing this. What it does, it finds all possible ways to connect, right, between two nodes. Why do we do this? Think of, we are, we are trying to get an ultra-reliable network. So if your link fails, you should not do rerouting. You should get the other paths ready in your hand. So first path fails, okay, what's the second path? You see, this is where the the concept of what we call uh, the tree-based routing comes in. So we find all possible paths between all possible nodes. Everything is stored somewhere in the controller and the controller sees the entire network from the top, what we call the bird's eye view. So here we see all possible ways one and three can be reached, okay? If you see the network on the left, the topology on the left, and you can see like one can be reached from three directly or via two or via two, four, three, so all possible ways. So, we did this um, uh, presentation and we got some results. So what you see here that there are three nodes which are, I think somebody's mic is on, um, some noise are coming in. So what is, uh, if you don't mind uh, solving your mouth please.
Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So, yeah. So, this is a result. I mean, again, a bit scientific way of representing it, not uh, a very business point of view of, 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 of representing like Francis did. Uh, so, what's happening here that you start from a network that is a sort of, um, I mean, fluctuating a lot. So, what this algorithm does when the fluctuation happens, it tuned itself in such a way that always they are converged. So they are like, if you just see the problem in this way that we started in a stage where all these three uh, routers are in the same state of utilization. When the load varies, like one router gets highly overloaded, the other one are like not that much loaded. So the load is distributed evenly and you again gets converged. This is the, 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 the low latency that we are trying to get, right? So we did this on um, some comparison and we got that the algorithm that we provide gives us, you know, uh, a better result than some of the existing standard. So let me quickly show you what's happening here. In the X axis, I'm in increasing the number of CPU threads. So number of loads I'm putting on the machine. And in the Y axis, you see the, the bandwidth, you know, it falls rapidly. Now, why it is falling? The links are not being affected. So why the bandwidth is falling? The reason is when your CPU is very loaded, your packet is waiting long time inside the queue, inside the CPU itself, right? And when that happens, your neighboring router thinks that the packet is lost. So it starts sending the packet again, and again, it loads the CPU. So that becomes like a, you know, a trickle down effect, okay? So that problem is solved when you use a software defined network, because now when this, thing happens you see a small spike here in the red curve that is what we are proposing so this one when the system gets overloaded and the software defined network controller sees okay so i have a better path right why do i use this this like consumed path or constrained path and it found the alternative path and you see the again it normalized itself but the other algorithms kept on increasing the you know the delay finally the enablers if someone wants to work on this field, someone wants to, you know, contribute to this knowledge, this uh, 5G and intelligent routing, what we now refer to as network intelligence, what are the skill set he must be having? The first one for the self optimization, you have to understand the mathematical modeling, which is called the stochastic network calculus that gives you the probabilistic view of the network. Um, time series analysis is very important because you see the problem in the time series and you analyze the patterns, right? So if you see the trends, you can prevent a lot of catastrophe. So if you are like forecasting like a share market that, okay, this particular uh, share is going to fall soon. So don't invest on that, in that, that share. Similarly, if you see a network in a network, a router is going to fail soon. Don't send traffic to that network, that router. Okay, that's a self optimization part. For self configuration, there's a new branch of networking has just shown up, which is called the, the network automation through which you program a router, right? You write a Python script, for example, and that script is going to configure the router automatically. Tools like Puppet, Ansible, Chef, Salt, they are there. They will ease your problem. Okay, just explain what you want to do. This will do the job. So, some configuration tools, like how do you actually express what you want to configure irrespective of the vendors. So you write one single script that I want to set a, let's say, uh, turn on um, RIP protocol. Now the protocol command may be different for different different vendors. You don't need to care about, you just say, I want to do this. And we have configuration tool like Yang, NetConf. They will translate your intent to the device specific commands. What we now refer to as in intent based networking if you have time just go and look ahead on this fact from cisco's website intent based networking for self healing we are trying to get live migration yeah so the, the service is running on one end and system sees that i'm going to fail soon why don't i migrate myself to a different system that's live migration and that is what what we are achieving the self healing with and finally the the self learning the machine learning part of it Two major problems you are solving. First, traffic classification, different types of traffic. The way your smartwatch interacts with the cloud is completely different than the traffic that you see when you consume YouTube videos. So your network must understand the streaming traffic and IoT traffic are two different types of traffic. 
and we have to classify them and treat them differently. The other one is route prediction, that what is going to be the, my, my best route if my primary route fails. I'll quickly show you a demo, like one minute maybe, just to, I mean, you see all these things in theory. I know that some of you want to see, okay, everything is good, looks in PPT, nice, but what it looks like in reality. So let me quickly share some of uh, my work that I did uh, in last couple of years. So what I just mentioned in the, uh, you know, that, that uh, algorithm that basically stretches uh, the graph, right? So what you see here on the left, there is a graph with five nodes with different, different colors. Now, if you see closely, you see the colors are changing over time. Now, what's happening there, I'm simulating, you know, a varying load on the devices. And when the load changes, it does some calculation. It normalizes the node cost into the edges and the edge means the links and they increases the length of it. And once that does, the time series is tracking it for a given time window and calculating something called reliability. Now you can see the reliability here in a small box, you know, the bar graphs. Now, if the reliability is less than 30%, I call it a red node, which is like a bad node. Someone which is middle, like from 30 to 60 is somewhere in the middle. And someone is more than 60 is the good. And you can find the number of counts here. How many of the five nodes we have five nodes here. How many of them are good? How many of them are mid? How many of them are bad? Now, after run, running it for some time, so what we actually get a traffic profile. Okay, so let me close this program quickly and show you the result of it. So I know for some of you it looks gibberish, but uh, let me explain what's happening here. Um, If you focus on the reliability graph, which is the top left corner, uh, what is happening here? If one of the uh, nodes, so five nodes and different colors are there, it falls, someone else will take over. So you see a red one failure and the orange one took over. The orange one failure, the green one took over. This is how the algorithm is working. And where the machine learning comes here, so these trends are being tracked by the machine learning algorithm. So this basically sees based on this result, which one I can trust. Now, if you're familiar with the share market trading, you can see similar graphs there. So based on the, the historical data, people you know, kind of um, decide that which share I should invest for. This is what we call technically a portfolio management. Okay, so I basically the same principle in the routing. So we try to manage the portfolio of each router. And based on that, we can decide which router is more reliable. So um, that's my time, I would say. Uh, uh, here I should finish with my presentation. I'm expecting some really tough question from you guys. Um, so this is what we're going to see in the next five years, if I'm not wrong. Um, this is what's going to happen. Because when I started my PhD three years back, SDN was in research papers. And now we see SDN in the industry. So with that extrapolation, I can see what I can see now in the research paper. I can expect that to see in the next five years. So happy learning and let's see what's gonna happen in the future. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just Okay, uh, so uh, the first uh, question can, uh, is asked by uh, one, one second, Mr. Kutsha Bukharji. Uh, uh, we first congratulate Mr. Francis and Mr. Shoptoshi for their amazing lecture session. And then we have asked one question that how can our existing fiber optic cables can deal with the 5G network. Uh, whether the traditional lines must be replaced or updated as per the uh, as per the bill. Is there any better alternative or not? The first question after you show Okay, so that is a, a, a technical question which I would ask uh, Subtashi uh, if you can uh, uh, take that one. Um, 
Satashi, could you take yeah, that sure, one? Sure, you got me there. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, oops, I'm right. Uh, your, your question, if I'm not wrong, is how fiber optic is going to be compatible with 5G scenario, right? Now, yes. Yeah, so, so as I mentioned that in 5G are trying to get uh, one feature which is called zero touch provisioning. So that means we don't want to touch, for example, the existing infrastructure. So we're gonna save a lot of money from the you know, service providers. The fiber optic is a very powerful link and we're gonna use both in like next 10 years. So 5G is gonna do something else, what we call the encapsulation on top of it. So what you see in case of your fiber optic, okay, that will be there, no change there. We'll be adding new protocols that will act on top of it, if that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Satoshi, next question uh, to you from uh, Shudipto Shaha and Yotima Nath uh, from mm -hmm. uh, Vidhan, Vidhan Chandra College, Rishra. Uh, yeah. uh, both of them are fourth semester students. Uh, mm -hmm. They have asked that, is there any significant harmful effect on human body or nature or different features in the 5G networking system in terms of wave or other GPS? to what is Interesting question. And first of all, uh, I'm feeling happy because I'm also from Ishra. So I know this college. Uh, yes, there is a lot of, of I've seen a lot of uh, information about it. 5G causes cancer and all this. Let me tell you something here. Try to Google a fact called star value. OK, now this is something which is regulated by the radio communication ministry of like every single country. Our human body is capable of sort of um, consuming a specific amount of radiation. Okay, so whenever 5G comes in or any technology comes in, the radiation is there, but the antennas that they are using inside the phones, they are regulated for those standards. Okay, so I mean your your in, your mobile phones antenna are much capable of doing what they are doing now, but they are limited. So there is a, a, an effect but that is not catastrophic. You're already inside the radiation every time. Your human body is capable enough to be immune from that. So don't get fear. Okay, then uh, next question for, uh, from PhD Rain College. Uh, Professor Devashi Shingo have asked that by which process it will cover the whole city? As uh, in the lecture session, we have learned that only 2% of the world already occupied uh, with 5G progress and how the economical background of 5G will flourish or become more helpful mm -hmm. for the normal life through as it is, as uh, we have already learned that it is too much costly or require more data. Yeah. Okay, yeah, this question, I would answer partially and then I'll, I'll move it over to Francis. Um, the first part I would say in case of 5G, it's a very early stage of development, right? That, that, I, that I'll first start with. Secondly, when we try to uh, accomplish technologies like this, we more move to the, the quality factor than the quantity factor, okay? Think of a very, like, uh, a very limited amount of economy is involved in cloud, you know, development of cloud. But we use cloud every day. We spread the technology and penetrate the technology to other technologies, all right? Now, for example, a, a simple uh, mobile phone manufacturer or, a, or a, a watch manufacturer is now including the cloud features on their devices. So yes, the, the, the scale is very small, I would say, but the penetration capability is very high. What this kind of technology does, they create a platform for other technologies to come in and build their product on top of it. So economically, I would say it's more on the economy of scale. Yeah, so once, a technology is built that scales other technology. If that makes sense, that's my my part of the answer. Rest, if Francis can uh, add more to it, Francis. Now, I think you've uh, you've answered very well. Uh, I think um, the it's economics of scales definitely. Uh, what happens usually is that um, for the we, for example, we go back to the 4G for example, and um, when that came out, mm -hmm. the cost of actually hopping onto 4G may seem. Yeah slightly high initially but the moment you start to build the uh, uh, sort of the the take up then you find different models 
different uh, uh, price models, if you like, where because yeah. of uh, uh, because of more people taking up and you want to lower the cost of that, then you have uh, you have models for somebody somebody going for a tariff of two gig or somebody going for a tariff of one gig in order to control this. So it's all going to be modeled on the market share, on the population, on the economics of that time. So um, I wouldn't worry about that. But like Saptashi has said, what's going to happen is that over time, you begin to see with economies of scale, the prices start to come down. There are more take up, there are more devices, there are more solutions, there are more ways it's being distributed and it just makes it a, a little bit more economical for everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Francis. Sapashi, uh, in uh, the next question, uh, one sec. Uh, he, uh, that this question is asked by uh, Mr. Sandeep Rajani. Uh, you have asked that what will be the status of the employment when the such kind of concept or such kind of new network system will uh, be established in front of us? Well, I could give you a very like happy answer, but that's not the case. Uh, in case of the, the engineering point of view, I would say if your skills are not up to date, you may lose your job. So there was a debate going on last month that says the network automation is in the words. Everyone is doing network automation. So what this network engineer job, right? So I said, no, what they will do, they will learn new technologies like these automation technologies. Since these are going to take care of, like for example, just think of what happened during the green revolution. The farmers lost their job, right? And they actually made the foundation of industrial revolution. So they learn new skills and they contributed to some other, you know, industry. There will be always people for buying things from you. You just need to tap that market. You just need to learn skills which is sellable. That's what I can say. Okay, then uh, the next question. Uh, uh, Acha, uh, Shatashi, uh, actually, uh, two students, uh, uh, number one is Rohit, uh, Rohit Sharma. And number two is Yotima Nak, and uh, both of them have asked the same category of question that mm -hmm. uh, we have already uh, seems to be such kind of incident that any kind of network uh, is being established in front of us. We have used any kind of network. There is a common scenario of network. Uh, there is a common scenario of security, means uh, threat to the uh, threat uh -huh. to okay. our private data. Then yeah. whether any kind of a methodology of established uh, to ensure better threat, uh, better threat in yes, of course. Network security is a parallel model. I mean, if you're from computer science background, you must know network security has its parallel model with TCP IP, right? So what happens in 5G, we secure the data in the cloud level. Okay, so we, we use a technique called multi-tenancy. So each tenant who's going to use the cloud is going to get their own private space right the data will be stored there and the communication that we are making is via a tunnel okay i'm if i'm being too technical i mean this is the only way of representing this answer so the tunnels are there technologies like gre uh, ipsec these will be there and as i mentioned the overlay network what is going to happen your network will be there just like typical network on top of this you'll create a virtual network and your routers will be connected over a tunnel right and this is going to encry encrypt your data. Standards are like, for example, AES, like 256-bit encryption. So very strong encryption to break, right? And now if you ask for the 5G beyond, we are trying to get something called decentralized uh, security with blockchains. So blockchain, just to add one single sentence here, is what we call a decentralized architecture. Means you save something there, you can't change it, OK? and this is what is going to be in the future uh, implementation of the security, if that makes sense. Okay, and the last question uh, I have, I want to be place in front of you, Shaktashi, uh, that mm -hmm. uh, there is a common uh, complaint from most of the customers uh, within a network that uh, we are, uh, their data are consuming at a very larger extent, but uh, their page responses are too much slow. Ah, uh, so is there any kind of intelligence, network intelligence, methodology or algorithm have established or included in 5G networking to prevent or to modify or to update such kind of uh, uh, 
complete. Yes, there are, there are. Now, let me first tell you why it happens because there's a concept called content caching that happens in the network. So just just think of it. You see a uh, like, let's say your network is very slow, but still you can watch a very popular YouTube videos in 1080p. How is it possible? Because your nearest ISP stores those data which are more frequently called, right? So that video is stored in your local ISP. You're not getting it from the internet. That's why you can see videos very easily, but sometimes the page takes long time. There's a new kind of architecture that is supported in 5G called mobile edge computing, or now it's called multi-access edge computing. Um, so if you're interested, there's a very good uh, presentation by Dr. Victor Bahal from Microsoft. Um, is uh, The topic is on uh, Cloudlet, okay? Just Google this, Microsoft Cloudlet, and you'll get the, the, the video. And he will explain how 5G is gonna solve this problem. Okay, and once you get this idea, I think you'll get your answer. So 5G has a feature of solving that problem of saving, uh, uh, talking about. But if you want to know more about it, that's the lecture you're going to see. Next, Shubhadeep. Next. Ah, uh, uh, okay, okay, madam. Ah, uh, okay. Shab 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 the next question uh, is from one second. The next question from Ashish Dash. Uh, mm -hmm. He has asked that. So uh, basically, Shaktoshi, he has asked that uh, we are currently using the 4G network, and uh, all the devices means uh, the mobile phones, the laptops are well equipped such kind of networking methodology or strategy. If mm -hmm. uh, the 5G has came. Ah, 5G will come, then whether we have to update our uh, the machines or the internal hardware and software configurations totally, and if you, whether it will be a time consuming or cost consuming issue, yeah. is the question by asked by uh, Ashish. And I'm yes. uh, one thing I am sorry yeah. to uh, re recapture, I am recapturing the name of the candidate who have asked the last question. His name is uh, Ms. Uh, Priyanka Dagar. Uh, I'm sorry to. Okay. So um, Ashish asked, right? Um, yes, you have to, because uh, what happens inside your phone? There is a modem that converts your analog signal from your network to digital data, and vice versa. So 5G modem, if I'm not wrong, Qual um, Qualcomm's 625 series uh, chips only support 5G at the moment. So there are a couple of phones which are 5G supported. So you have to upgrade your phone. You can't get 5G, even if you get a 5G. Uh, you know, you are in a 5G network, although your phone cannot receive 5G signal, cannot decode those signals because your hardware doesn't support it. Okay, so yes, you have to. There's no software limitation, software is just like abstracted from the network, so uh, you have to upgrade your phone. There are some phones coming in at the moment, but I would say don't uh, upgrade at this stage because 5G is still in a, in a you know, evaluation stage. Okay, so at least wait for like three, four years from now, you'll get a full period 5G. Okay, Shatoshi, the last question from uh, from a teacher from uh, Shurina College, uh, Professor Obhijit Potta. Mm -hmm. He has asked the question that uh, with the issues, uh, basically he has asked the question to Mr. Francis, that uh, with issues dropping up around the way, uh, will adoption of 5G will be delayed in UK or elsewhere? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Yes, uh, Mr. Francis, yes, asked that with the with issues dropping around to uh, the adoption of 5G will be delayed in UK or elsewhere. Is the adoption of um, 5G delayed in UK or elsewhere? Did I get that right? Yes, Francis, yes. Okay, well, <clears throat> so um, I know for certain that um, uh, a number of carriers, so like EV, for example, which we have in this country, is actually um, rolled, well, they've rolled out uh, the 5G, um, um, the spy 5G, so if you wanted to, you can actually, uh, be, you can actually get connection to them. Um, is it delayed? Um, I think, again, it's a question of, it's not so much is it delayed, I think it's the state which is at. 
Um, so there's more. I mean, uh, Subtash, you back me up on this if 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 I'm not wrong. Is that it's not so much just uh, you know is it delayed? I think it's the fact that what we're seeing at the moment and also where it's moving into is that correct, Subtashi? Yes, Francis. It's all about the the evaluation results we are waiting for. So yeah. once that is done, then it will roll out to the industry and they will find the plans of implementation and then we'll get it. I believe this will take some time. Okay, Shaptashi. Yeah. Hello, Shaptashi. Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Hello. Yes, I can hear you, sure. Uh, uh, then the next question is from Orijit Dotto. Uh, he has asked you, Shaptashi, mm -hmm. that could you please uh, tell us about the massive NEMO technology? Finally, I got a technical question. Yes, I was waiting for it. Uh, Massive MIMO um, um, is one of the technology that was there for a long time. So MIMO stands for multiple in, multiple out. So these kind of antennas, they, they, they can receive and transmit multiple signals simultaneously. Okay, so now we see that the antennas like a cylindrical antennas, we will see some like uh, a grid-like antenna in the future for 5G. A quick example, this technology was there with us for last 10, 20 years. These were used in the military aircrafts in their radars. Okay, So if you open the cone of the aircraft, you see a, a radar is there. And that was the massive MIMO technology. What it does, it basically scans the entire network actively. right? And it does a technology called beamforming. So it sees where the user is and tries to optimize. See, the self-optimization part is there. It tries to optimize that where the user is and how should I steer the beam so that the user will get the maximum bandwidth. OK, so that's kind of like one liner for massive MIMO. That's a whole different branch of study, I would say. Uh, yes, if you're from telecommunication, if you're studying electronics, maybe you can uh, have a look on this. And that also, uh, uh, let me just add one more line. It also. Um, uh, leverage the legacy of, um, you know, uh, JC Bose. He invented the technology of, of millimeter wave, like long back, and this is what we're using in massive MIMO nowadays. So yes, massive MIMO. It's a very powerful technology, and that much I can say in a moment. Shaktashi, uh, then uh, a student, uh, Ashish Das, again ask you uh, to tell about some open sources to learn the fight is there any kind of open sources are available not really not open source i would say there are some paid courses uh, out there i would say i mean open if you want to read there are lots of materials so um, you need to go to a website called 5g ppp public private partnership right this website you go there and this is the european union 5g initiative and they put their white papers online. OK, so please go to this website, go for the white papers and read them from 2015, where they started from. Otherwise, you can't, you know, can't understand if you just read the latest one. Go and start reading from it. You'll get a lot of information there, starting from the inception of 5G. What was their plan? How did they change the architecture step by step? OK, that is what I can uh, I can um, tell you to go and have a look on this. Okay, then uh, uh, next question. do you have more questions for the speakers? O only only one question left, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Mr. Sandeep Rajani, Shaptoshi again asked you that due mm -hmm. to uh, the current scenario, we can, it's a very common effect that due to the magnetic field on the earth mm -hmm. in this uh, recent days, the satellite communications are time to time uh, become with it. Uh, yeah. With a 5G, able to overcome this problem is there any uh, intelligent well 5g i would say is not a satcom technique it's more on terrestrial um, communication model um, although people are trying to uh, implement software defined network in satellite but they're all in papers only okay there's no implementation so far because you don't have that much satellites a quick reason i'm telling you why it is not that much feasible Satellite sat communication is point to point communication. So you send data to a satellite, you take back from there. It's not, it's not broadcast communication, right? Now, 
5G is more terrestrial communication. So it will work on the terrestrial perspective, not to the SATCOM. Maybe there is some extension to it, but not um, that much feasible to my understanding. Um, so yeah, it's not going to affect that much in, in 5G because 5G at its core is not for satellite communications. Okay, so uh, uh, now we end up the Q&A session here. And uh, now I request you to then for the letter uh, of I would add one more thing. Um, if you guys have any more question, you can obviously send us, um, me and Francis. I think the emails are shared. Um, obviously, it's a very vast topic, and I know you are craving for questions. So you can actually send us questions. We are happy to answer that. That would be useful. If it is, if it is, in, if it is in India in perspective, I wouldn't say no, uh, because we had three partners, um, Siemens. Um, uh, Nokia and uh, and Huawei and Huawei just due to various reasons they're not coming, so uh, the other two partners are there, and Siemens is doing a really good job in the European market. Um, they are implementing 5G, so I don't see a very a huge amount of lag that we can face because we have redundancy. Um, yeah, Huawei, we, I mean they have made it first, but there are other partners in the market as well. So that won't make any difference to my perspective. For the UK, I think Francis can answer better. All, All right. right. Uh, yeah. Um, what I can do is dig into that a little bit more. So if we want to take these questions, uh, like Subtanshi said, send us a little bit more, then we can come back to you on a bit more detail on that. Correct. Uh, yeah, 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 yes, madam. Yes, madam. Uh, so, uh, we have ended up the webinar. Uh, we are the ending, ending part of the webinar. And lastly, uh, I want to say that we, the people of the Department of Health Science, PhD Gen College, greatly thankful, firstly, to all the members of our of the governing body of our college, then greatly thankful to our respected principal, madam, then to all the respected speakers, thereafter to our head of the department, and all of our department and teachers, and lastly, not last but not the least, all the audience who are being with us throughout the entire event, and to inspire us consistently to successfully create, launch, and come to Thanks, all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, speakers, Mr. Francis. Hope to meet you Thank again, Chaptarshi. You are not new to our institution. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. 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 Okay. Wish you a very happy weekend. Okay. And um, so thanks to all here. the participants. Thanks yeah. to all the participants here. All the very best. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.